Uh, we've been working with uh, the IPA for, for FWorks to build out a white paper to work out how to deliver the best-in-class measurement strategy for marketing effectiveness. And over the last five, six months or so, we've been working with about 40 UK brands responsible for about £7 billion worth of advertising in the UK to come up with what we think is the right path the brand should take to make sure that marketing is working as hard as possible. Now, I've been in the industry for about 25 years, and um, this is almost a, a personal motto in a way. Uh, the longer I've been doing this, the more and more I'm convinced that you've got to make sure measurement is as simple as possible, but as complicated as necessary. So sure, the world's a complex place, right? It, maybe I didn't realize how complex it, complex it was with the swarms, but it's a complicated place, so we've got to color in our analysis. But equally, we've got to make sure that the output and the results are simple. Because if they're not simple, we can't explain them. We can't defend them. We can't justify them. And if we can't do those things, they're not going to be used. So we've wasted our time building the effectiveness uh, metrics. So we've got to make sure the output is simple. Now, one of the questions I've been asked is why now um, for a white paper on marketing effectiveness? I think, I think now is, is absolutely the right time. We, we did uh, some independent research with CMOs three years ago to find out what the main pain points they were facing. And it was all to do with data. Data was in silos. Data were in different systems. It was taking an inordinate length of time just to pull out simple, descriptive metrics to explain what was happening, not even to understand, am I echoing a little bit? No, no I'm OK. Um, not even to explain why something's happening, just purely descriptive statistics. That was three years ago. We've moved on a little bit since then. So today, the data is fine. We're getting a handle on the data. We're pulling the data out. Systems talk to each other. Now the issue is more around insights. So we're data rich, but insights poor. And even where we have insights, the insights are in silos. So the insights are embedded within one part of the organization. They're not being taken to another part. And it makes it really hard to use those insights. And also, we're not really focusing on the metrics that absolutely matter. Now, it's a truism to say that just because you can measure something, it doesn't mean you can use it to manage. Just because you can measure something doesn't mean you should do it. And that's absolutely the case. <coughs> we need to focus really on the metrics that matter. Um, and the key challenge facing CMOs today is basically to make sure that they can justify, that they can explain to other people in their organization how marketing can be the engine room for growth, how it can really drive the company forward in terms of profitability, growth, year on year. And in the course of the research and, and, and over the years working with our clients, we found that there are three key pillars that brands and companies have to hit to get to a best-in-class measurement strategy. And those are fortitude, getting the ecosystem right, and recognizing that actually, for measurement effectiveness, you're on a journey. It's not a destination, it's a journey, and the goalposts keep changing. Um, we're going to go through each of those in a second. But before we do that, I just want to say the key thing, really the key thing, and the biggest barrier to effectiveness, to measuring effectiveness, is not defining success first. We see it time and time again. And if you don't define success first, nothing ever truly succeeds, and nothing ever really fails. And if nothing ever fails, you never learn. It's really hard to move forward. OK, so the first thing I would absolutely say is define success first. If we look to fortitude, we think fortitude, and there's a bit of overlap here with some of the things that Fran would have been saying this morning. Fortitude is almost going towards the culture. It's building up the political and the emotional strength and connections within an organization to make sure that you can break down the silos, to make sure that you can take the insights out of the different silos, to make sure that you can collaborate with different departments, not just finance. I mean, we've been talking about that for, for a couple of decades, it seems now but collaborate across the organization to make sure that you can really drive change. The research, the insights, they can be as powerful as anything, but if you haven't got that connection with other people in the organization, they are just simply not going to be used. So fortitude is absolutely key. Just a little bit controversially, I put zero-based budgeting on there. We are not proponents of zero-based budgeting. Uh, the evidence is a bit mixed. I mean, we've, we've seen sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's probably about 40, 60 in favor of it not working, actually. 
But what I would say with zero-based budgeting is it's great to have that as a mindset. So to look through the marketing plan and understand exactly what each element of that plan is trying to do. Because if you know what it's trying to do, then you'll pick the right metric to measure it. Now, if it's there to drive short-term sales, and I'm sure Les will talk about this later on, but if it is there to drive short-term sales, that's fine. Pick a metric that will, that, that, that will measure that. If it's there to drive brand strength, brand salience, again, pick the right metric to measure that. But absolutely have that mindset when you go into, uh, into the evaluation process. If you think about the ecosystem, the ecosystem is really the questions to ask and how you would go about answering those questions. I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about different methodologies. I, I, I think, although I'd be happy to do that, I think most people would probably get up and walk out if I start talking about you know, econometrics versus um, advanced statistical analysis. But it's all about asking the right questions, building the team, making sure you've got the right people in place who can answer those questions, making sure you've got the right people who can curate the answers and give the right level of detail to the right people at the right time so that those answers can be used. So one of the key things on there is, is why are we asking? I mean, it seems quite a simple question, but so many times we, we come across people who are evaluating things. They're developing return on investment analysis. They're looking at the impact of one factor on another. They don't always stop and step back and say, well, what decision do I actually need to take here? What decision am I going to make on the back of this research? And is this research, is this measurement piece the right thing to do to allow me to do that? So I would say, when, uh, why, why are we asking is absolutely key. How to report, making sure people see the right level of detail and the right metric at the right time, goes back to our hierarchy of metrics. Now, for most of our clients, um, and pretty much everybody that we interviewed in the course of this, this research, year-on-year -year profitable growth was the main KPI that their businesses were assessed on. <clears throat> so, obviously, there are exceptions, the not-for-profits, the charities, the public broadcasters. But for most commercial companies, year-on-year -year profitable growth. That is the main KPI. Other KPIs derive their importance only insofar as they have an impact on profitable growth. So, yeah, short-term return on investment, that's a key metric. Most people that we spoke to looked at the short-term return on investment of their media spend. In the 25 to 30 years I've been in business, I have never once seen a short-term return on investment declared to the stock market. It is not a key metric. It does not affect the share price. It does not have a direct impact on year-on-year -year profitable growth. It's a great metric for making sure your media budget is used as efficiently as possible, for sure. So it derives its importance from that, which then ladders up into like for like volume sales increase, maybe ladders up into market share growth, maybe ladders up into brand strength. But it derives its importance only because it ladders up ultimately into profitability. Now, this year I was lucky enough to be invited to be one of the technical judges of the, uh, of the Effectiveness Awards. Um, and myself, along with the other four judges, we went through more than 30 papers. And I just want to pull out two KPIs. I was a bit surprised that all of the papers we looked at, value perception and price elasticity, and the long-term effects of advertising, they were hardly discussed at all. And for me, these have got really strong correlation with profitable growth. I'm going to talk about value perception first. I'm sure this is an example people have seen before. It's quite a common example. We've got a brand that retails at £1.90. We've got a known label equivalent that retails at 35p. They are, to all intents and purposes, the same product. Same active ingredient, same number of tablets in a packet, roughly the same amount of time before the active ingredient disseminates throughout the bloodstream and cures the pain. So they are exactly the same product, except one's a brand and one's not. One is sold at five times, five and a half times the price of the other. Now, that's the power of marketing. That's one way to, to, to estimate the long-term effects of advertising. But more importantly, we've seen with a lot of our clients, it's possible to shift that over time with prolonged advertising, and although we didn't necessarily know the language before, using fluid devices that Orlando spoke about this morning. So strong, creative advertising, storytelling, emphasizing the brand promise. These are all things that can shift value perception and the price elasticity. 
and will make brands more profitable. Just as a very, very simple example, a rough benchmark, if your price elasticity, which measures how responsive consumers are to price changes, if it's at about minus two and a half, a price increase will destroy profits. Okay, people will leave the brand. Enough people will leave the brand that the ones remaining pay, paying the higher price, it won't compensate. If the price elasticity is lower, it's closer to zero, it may be minus two, maybe one and a half, a price increase will drive profits. People stay within the brand. Not enough people quit the brand, and that will drive profitability. So using powerful, creative advertising, storytelling, emphasizing the brand promise, that will drive profitability. It has a clear and demonstrable effect on year-on-year -year profits. It is a key metric and one that we should really focus on. I should get off my soapbox a little bit. But the, the other one is uh, the long-term effects of advertising. And we should probably call it sustained effects rather than the long-term effect. This kind of artificial divide into the short-term and long-term probably doesn't help the debate. The, the, the debate. I mean, what happens with the, the long-term effect of advertising is for some markets within CPG, we're almost encouraging repeat purchase. People come in, they try the product, they buy the product, and they repeat purchase. You know, we hear a lot about Byron Sharp, and he doesn't believe that kind of analysis. We've seen with single source data, it works. Uh, so so we, we know those effects are real. We see it in finance as well, and we see it in retail. We know that people will come in on the back of advertising, and they will stick with the brand, provided the advertising is impactful enough, and the, the brand promise lives up to the communications in the advertising. And we've seen the long-term effects from advertising, or the sustained effects of advertising, four or five times as high as what you would conventionally model in the short term. So two really key metrics that I think we should uh, pay much more attention to, value perception or price, price elasticity <coughs> and the long-term effects of advertising. I spoke about the journey as well. So we've talked, what are, what are the, three, the three key pillars to deliver a best-in-class uh, marketing effectiveness measurement strategy? One was fortitude, one was the ecosystem, but also it's a journey. So right at the beginning of the journey, we're just using data in a purely descriptive sense. So what is happening now? Now, that was the case two or three years ago. That was a bit of a struggle. There were many companies, many big multinational companies for sure, who were struggling to use data just to say what is happening now, never mind moving up the value chain into why it's happening and anticipating what's going to happen next. Best in class... You're not just understanding what's happening. You're not just explaining. You're not just anticipating. You're now using those insights to embed change into the organization and change for the better. And that takes fortitude. So these pillars are all linked. So to embed change, you need to have built up those collaborations. You need to have built up those networks within the organization. You know, if a piece of research or a measurement piece says press advertising, for example, is not working well, cut the press but there are stakeholders who are interested in press. So you need to build up those networks to make sure that change can be driven home. Um, now, as part of the research, we actually asked people, we asked the, the 35, 40 brands where they marked themselves on this value chain. And it was quite interesting. It's self-marked, so it's not exactly scientific. But only 10% of respondents had themselves just using data purely for descriptive purposes. About 60% were towards the top end. So 60% of us are actually using the research and analytics to anticipate what's going to happen next and to drive change, which is an encouraging place to end on. I think we've got two minutes. So I'm just going to do my last slide. I couldn't really do anything on measurement without talking about different tools. Now, my God, there are hundreds of shiny analytic tools out there with eager consultants desperate to sell you the latest piece of kit. Some of them even work. Some of them even do what they say, by no, by no means all. But I guess for me, the main message today is it doesn't matter. If you haven't got the fortitude, if you don't have the ecosystem right, if you don't know what you're measuring and you don't know where you are on the journey, it simply doesn't matter what research tool you're using because you won't have built up the networks to embed the results. You won't have built up the political structures to take the results out of a silo and disseminate across the company. It's really, really key to get those three pillars in place first. And just six key takeouts to end on. 
hopefully most of them are self-explanatory. I just want to talk about the last one. And it's more of an observation rather than a takeout. Through talking to you know, the various brands that were part of this, this research, I would say more often than not, the companies that are ranked higher in terms of a measurement effectiveness strategy and where they are on that are those companies that use test and learn on an almost constant basis. For sure, they use lots of other techniques as well. So they've probably got an MMM in place. They definitely use brand strength studies. But they're doing regular test and learns. They're trying things. They're learning. They're either then embedding them or they're rejecting them. But it's test and learn that will drive a company forward. <laughs>